How did the three hundred million dollar Afghanistan deal come about? What was that conversation like when you first learned about it? So I was uh, I first learned about it. I was driving home to uh, have dinner with my girlfriend, and Ephraim calls me up, and he's like, he's like, dude, dude, you got to get to the office right now, right now, right now. I'm like, I'm about to have go have dinner. I already made plans, you know. He's like, fuck that, fuck that. You want to get rich, or you want to go, you know, like you want to like you know hang out with your girl. Your girlfriend will be sucking your dick after you have much money you're about to make, you know. And you know, I'm like, I'm like, this could wait till tomorrow. It's not an emergency, you know. Just tell me, all right. Just tell me over the phone. He's like, he's like, fine, fine. I can't believe you're you're, you're not serious about this, you know. <laughs> it's like everything, like you know, it was like everything revolved around like. Um, and so he's like, he's like, he's like, uh, I just saw this massive contract and it's all the kind of stuff that we've been dealing with already. So we've got great connections for it. This is going to be the biggest thing we've ever done, you know, um, you know, we'll, and you know, he's like, it's all, it's all Warsaw Pact stuff. So, um, you know, it, the U S can't get it, you know, they don't manufacture it in the United States. They're going to need to go through brokers, you know, like us and, you know, they're going to need to find suppliers and we already have all the past performance for all this stuff because we've already delivered in much smaller quantities, you know, these type of, uh, munitions. Uh, so he was super excited. And, uh, then we, you know, uh, uh, usually we had a deal, um, that we would split, you know, the deals that I worked on 50, 50, um, uh, you know, because he would like put up the money and he would do the final negotiations and we would do the contract under his company and all that. And I would do all the work. And that was kind of like our deal. Um, and he's like, you know, usually we do 50, 50, but for this, uh, you know, I, uh, I already got a lot of these contacts, you know, this is kind of my bread and butter. So we'll do 75, 25, but he's like, but don't worry, this, this contract's so huge. You're going to make millions off this. I'm like, okay, fine. You know, I'm, I'm good with it. Whatever. Did you I'm say not. initially how big it was? Uh, so we had no idea, oh, okay. you know, like what the final number was going to be because we hadn't gotten prices on it. He just saw the quantities of, of okay. like munitions that they were asking. And it was like the first item was like a hundred million rounds of like AK-47 ammo, 762 by 39. There was like a hundred thousand grenades, you know what I mean? Like the, there's like millions and millions and tens of millions of dollars at minimum, you know? Um, you know, we knew like right away, these, these quantities, we'd never seen them before. It's like literally like 20 times bigger than anything we'd ever seen. Um, and that was like bigger than the biggest things we've seen. So it was massive. Um, and so we started, you know, he started contacting all, all the people that he, you know, already knew. And, you know, my job was to pretty much scour the internet and the world and find any, uh, sources of supply that he had missed, you know, in his few years of doing this. So, you know, for these types of items. So he gave me a list of, you know, all the people he was already talking to. He's like, don't talk to these people. These are my contacts. Anyone else, you know, is fair game. Go for it. So, you know, I spent probably like a month and a half. I don't remember the exact time frame, but of, you know, just like all day, you know, I would go through these massive lists of like armed suppliers that there were these directories online. Half of the entries were like, you know, old and not relevant anymore. And the phone numbers didn't go anywhere, you know, and most of them didn't have email addresses. You had to call up and then they don't speak English and you have to, you know, find the one guy in the factory that speaks English and his English is terrible. And you, then he gives you a, like a fax number. You have to fax them what you want. And then they like, you know, it's like a whole rigmarole, you know, they're not, built for doing business really because these are like all um uh the remedy where we were, we were finding uh you know uh, uh these items were only made in the warsaw pack countries because it was all warsaw pack munitions it was mm. it was all munitions it wasn't weapons this contract it was uh the idea was to supply the afghan army and police for like the next 30 years you know that was like the idea um because uh, this was the last year of bush's presidency he thought that um, the next president might be a Democrat, which he was right, you know, Obama. But he thought that the next president would pull out of Afghanistan immediately and leave the Afghans high and dry, which he was wrong. I mean, you know, it took until right. 2020 uh, or was it 21, 2021 before we pulled out. Mm. Um, so Bush wanted to arm the Afghans with as much stuff as possible before he left office. So that's why they did this massive contract. Um, so this contract was just for munitions. So everything that was used in the weapons, so like everything from like pistol ammo to like anti-aircraft rockets and like tank shells and, uh, and, uh, mortar shells and, and, you know, big things, grenades, you know, big things like that. So the United States 
you know, decided to supply Warsaw Pact weapons uh, because, you know, one, the people they're supplying, the Afghans and the Iraqis, already were trained in those weapons, but also, bonus, much cheaper, right. you know, than Western weapons. Uh, and the United States wanted to spend as little as possible, you know, in, in this endeavor. So, uh, so they put out this contract for all the munitions. Um, and uh, we, you know, scoured the internet, we got all the prices. Um, uh, and uh, eventually, it took us a few months to gather it all together and to make our very complex spreadsheets, uh, you know, which took into account, uh, you know, the cost of the goods, where it was located, how much it would cost us to transport, you know, to Afghanistan, because Afghanistan is a lock, landlocked country. And it's surrounded by unfriendly countries like uh, Pakistan, which is very unstable. You know, then there's the central, you know, um, uh, Asian countries. And so you need to really fly everything in there. You can't drive it because it's at high risk of uh, of getting, uh, you know, hijacked. Um, if you have a truck convoy going from like the port of Karachi into Kabul, it's not a very safe route. Um, you know, oh. there's a lot of warlords over there who would love <laughs> to get their hands on a huge convoy of weapons. So, you, you know, the, you have to fly it now flying is, is way more expensive than shipping, you know, like minimum four or five times more expensive, depending on the route. Um, usually a lot more, but, um, uh, so because of the, f the, f we had to fly everything we, you know, logistics was a major factor in the cost. Uh, so we had to, you know, build these complex spreadsheets of like how much it would cost, you know, per volume, per weight to fly it into Afghanistan from various <clears throat> locations. And after we had it all figured out and uh, we got our final price, Ephraim decided to put um, uh, a 9% profit margin on it for us because he figured that everyone else will probably do 10 <laughs> so that we should do nine, you know, just to undercut them. And uh, it turned out that he had, you know, way lowballed it. Uh, it's a famous scene in the movie where we find out, you know, about by how much it was. That's a real number. I think it was. I think that's a, that, that scene's actually in the trailer too. Yes, it's in the trailer. That's right. Um, so that's it. Didn't happen like that. You know, we did find out how that we had lowballed it by about fifty-two or fifty-three million dollars. Uh, but we found it out over the phone, which obviously makes for a, a less exciting scene on film. Uh, that scene did happen uh, where, uh, you know, it, it wasn't me, actually. It was Ephraim and Ralph went to Rock Island Arsenal uh, to meet with all the, uh, the, the government contracting officers, uh, you know, before they gave us the contract. So they, they met Ephraim in person before giving him that contract. He brought Ralph because Ralph is an older gentleman. So he figured because he's so young, he needed like an older guy to, you know, give make them feel a little bit more secure. Mm. Um so yeah, we, we submitted our bid and then like a few months later, we, we didn't hear anything for a few months. And then they suddenly came to us. They're like, you're in the final uh, stages. We need to do like, like, I think it was like four or five different types of audits. You know, they wanted to look at our books. They wanted to look at, you know, like, um, you know, like our accounting system, you know, they, they sent like a team of people to our office to, you know, to check us out. You know, they, they, did due diligence on us how long yeah how long from the point where you submitted the bid mm. well actually first of all yeah working on the bid yeah it took you how long to work on that to build that bid so if i recall correctly the initial work was about one and a half months okay. something of like intense work like i was okay. working all night you know because i was mm. always trying to get people on the phone and they're in like different time zones mm -hmm. and you know you have to like sometimes they'll only call you back they won't like you know everything's by phone for some people so you have to be like available at any mm. moment you know because if you miss their phone call they won't like call you back for another week or ever you know right. so it was a huge pain to deal with them. And then you had yeah. to include the price of fuel yes. for air transport exactly. and everything else. Yeah. We had to um, calculate all that. So yeah, so that took about a month and a half. And what was the price? Yeah. So the final price, including our 9% profit margin. So, was, you, so yeah, sorry to interrupt. Yeah, yeah. So you came up with the price mm -hmm. and then of what it would cost you, then you just added 9%. Correct. Okay. That's how we did it. Okay. And we figured that would be our profit margin. Okay. Uh, so including the profit margin, the entire total price, uh, was about $298 million. Okay. And it, you know, 
just for reference, the biggest thing that we'd ever done under AEY previously, I think, was like $18 million in, in total, which, you know, Ephraim made a few million dollars from. So that's not nothing to sneeze at. You know, he made millions of dollars from that contract, that $18 million. But it was like less than 10%, you know, 7% of the, you know, this other contract. Now, did yeah. you guys, I'm sure you guys like yeah. went through this with like a, a fine tooth comb yeah. and made sure that it was, yeah. it was solid airtight mm -hmm. what was the did you email this quote did you mail the quote what was it like how did you send it and right. what was that moment like where you right. guys were like <gasps> yeah press the button right so it's interesting because most of the government quotes you just email it to them or you like <clears throat> upload a file on their website you know depending on which department you're working uh your your the contract is for you know like uh, uh, sometimes if you're selling to the state department ver versus the army, they have like a slightly different system, or at least they did. I mean, I don't know if they've changed now, but, um, for this particular contract, and I don't know why they did this, but they wanted everything in paper, you know, paper and CD of all things, you know, they didn't want us to like upload it to their, to the site. Mm. So we had to print out everything. It was like a massive stack of papers like that. And, you know, with all the supporting documents and, and everything and a CD where we had like spreadsheets on it, you know, certain files that they requested. And then we had to uh, overnight it to them. But Ephraim had this horrible uh, habit of always doing everything at the last second. I don't know why. It's just what he did. And so, like, you know, we, we had everything done and we waited until the day, the deadline, you know, like we, if we overnighted it, it would get to them the next day. So it was like the day before was the deadline. And like, it was like four o'clock, the, the, uh, the, uh, post office is going to close at five. And, you know, he, and he was just like, well, oh, should I do 9%? Should I do 8%? What if someone else is thinking 9% because everyone else is doing 10? Yeah. You know, he was like, he was torn, you know, eight or 9%, eight or 9%. Yeah. And he just couldn't decide until it, I was like, Ephraim, you have to decide because it's like 430 and we're going to not bid on this if, if you keep on dawdling. And finally he's like, fuck it, fuck it. And, you know, 9%. And we, we put it in, into the spreadsheet, printed it all out. And then it was like only 10 minutes until the post office was going to close. We get into his car and he's like, like going 60 miles an hour down residential, like, you know, <laughs> uh, streets, you know, to like, you know, skidding around corners to get to the post office because he had like only a few minutes later, you're like running in and we like literally made it by like two minutes left, you know, before like it closed and finally like submitted it. Um, yeah. And it, it was just. I don't know why he did it. He did that for like everything. Everything was like, like at the last second, like everything's super stressed. It was just like, he kind of like lived off the stress, you know, like, mm -hmm. like, yeah, that's just was his personality Feed, on the stress. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. then, so after that, there were some signs that they were interested, right? Yeah. They, they like you were subscribing, like yeah. they were, they, uh, they were calling you, they were trying yeah. to audit the company. Yeah. And what else were they doing? So they, there were a few different audits that they had to do. So uh, first, they didn't speak to us at all for like, I think something like two months, you know? Wow. Yeah, we were like, oh, well, we probably lost, you know? That's why we didn't hear You guys anything. just kept, kept moving on. Yeah, we just we just started working on other things, you know? We're like, okay, we spent the last two months working on this huge thing, you know? It's a role. Of, we didn't actually, we thought it was a low chance of us winning. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. We didn't think that we had a high chance. We were like, you know, everybody in the industry is going for this contract, mm -hmm. including like the biggest players like General Dynamics, multi-billion dollar company, ATK, you know, like these are like publicly listed companies. They have like a department with like 100 people who are doing what we're doing, you know, just two guys, you know. So uh, we're like, you know, they, these guys have been doing this business for decades and they have like huge teams of people. They're probably going to beat us, but we technically um, uh, qualify to bid, you know, because we have the past performance, so we could bid. It's not like we're automatically disqualified, so we have to bid, you know, because what if we win? You know, right. it's like a small chance, but such a big upside. So, uh, so we, that's why we bid on it. But we didn't really expect to win. We thought it was a we thought it was a small chance. Um, and then, like two months later, suddenly they called us up and they're like. Um, you know, we're, we're, do, we have to do some due diligence. Uh, you know, we're making our final decision soon. And part of that final decision, we have to do all these audits and we're like, whoa, we're like in the, in the final running, you know, like we didn't know we were, that they, that we were the number one choice or anything. We thought maybe they're like, you know, they narrowed it down to like three or five companies, you know, out of everyone who bid. 
And, um, and I think it was something like 30 or 40 companies bid something like that. And, um, you know, they narrowed, I think they like, we thought that they were like narrowing it down and now they had to do all this like due diligence on all the companies because it's a massive contract. They didn't usually do this. In fact, we never had this done on even the $20 million contract. They never did this, but for $300 million contract, it's a whole other level of, of, you know, homework that they, that they need to do. And so they wanted, you know, as I mentioned before, they wanted to see our accounting system. <clears throat> they wanted to, um, uh, you know, they wanted to see what our financials were like. They wanted to see that they, that we were able to, uh, afford to deliver on this contract because the way the U S government works is, is they, they make an order and then you deliver to them. And then 30 days later after you deliver is when they pay you. Right. So you need, and most suppliers are not going to give you credit. So you need to have the money to finance, you know, to buy the goods in order to sell it to the U S government and wait 30 days, uh, you know, before you get paid. Right. So, you know, having the money to, to float that deal, uh, you, you know, is critical. And so they did a financial audit of, of the company and, um, uh, they did like a sourcing audit. They wanted to know where we were going to get everything. We, that's where I mentioned that, uh, you know, we listed, uh, Henry, mm -hmm. uh, or at least Henry's company. Um, and, uh, you know, we had to tell them where we were getting everything, what our logistics plan was, you know, they, they really wanted us to tell them how we were going to do everything. And they, they sent, uh, uh, you know, like auditors to our office. Uh, you know, we had to, um, because Ephraim had never like done his books like ever. You know, like he literally, he didn't have an accounting system at all. You know, everything was the seat of the pants. And so they wanted to see an accounting system. So he hired a, a, uh, an accountant and he's like, Hey, government wants to see an accounting system. We have to build it. And, he, and the guy's like, what you haven't been doing your accounting, like for the last two years, you know? And everyone's like, no, I just, you know, transfer money and get paid. And you know, what if, I know I'm making money, but that's all that matters, you know? Uh, and, um, so the, so he had to like go and backtrack on all the deals Ephraim had done and input it into an accounting system so that, you know, it looked like Ephraim had a rock solid accounting system mm -hmm. that had been going back a few years, you know? Uh, so that was just like one component of it. And, you know, and then they asked him to come and meet them in person, um, in Rock Island Arsenal, which is where, uh, the, uh, the contract was being managed out of. And that's when he took Ralph, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and met them in person. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, that's it was, they, it was they, intense. And they actually did tell him that he, out, he underbid by 50 million. He did, but not in that scene. He, he told, <laughs> they told us over the, yeah, right. I, it was, I actually am the one who found that out because I was the one dealing with, uh, this was already after we had won the contract and we were already starting okay. to like deliver. And I was talking, I be, kind of became friendly with one of the contracting officers and, you know, I was kind of just schmoozing with him on the phone, you know, and, you know, just talking and he's like, oh, you guys, you know, you're really kicking ass. You, uh, you know, you're really saving us some money. And I'm like, oh, is that right? And he's like, yeah, yeah. You were like way cheaper than everyone else. And I'm like, really? How much? <laughs> and he's like, well, I shouldn't be telling you this, but, uh, between me and you, you know, uh, you guys came in like 53 million under, I was like, oh my God. And I told Ephraim and he's like, fuck. <laughs> fucking couple of schlemiels yeah. <laughs> he was so pissed he was so pissed he's like we could have made so much more money yeah